Hi, I'm Gareth Green and in this video we're going to have a little look at some of a very famous piece of music by Rachmaninoff. It's his vocalese written in 1915 as the last of a set of 14 songs and the idea is that it's sung but there are no words so the singer can make a vowel of uh, their own choice and that's how the piece is performed. So it's a kind of song without words, a little bit in that tradition of people like Mendelssohn who wrote songs without words for the piano. This is a song without words, but it is actually sung. And this comes in many arrangements. It's often played on the cello, for example, and works very well. But what's interesting about this piece, apart from its beauty, is how Rachmaninoff makes use of a very short motif to kind of build his melodic line. And that's what we'll be talking about very shortly. But first of all, let's just get a flavor of the piece. And so it goes on. I just wanted to go into that bar at the bottom of this page to show you how the drama then builds into this poco più animato section. It's an absolutely gorgeous piece. And if you know the piece, you'll know that. If you don't know the piece, absolutely worth listening to a complete performance of it. It's got some lovely harmony in it and a gorgeous melodic line. And uh, this is absolute sort of hallmark stuff for Rachmaninoff. But let's have a little look at how he spins this line from this motif. Well, if you look at the very opening of where the voice starts, even though Rachmaninoff is writing these long phrases, they're actually constructed out of these very short ideas. So this opening thing, it's a very simple idea, isn't it? Taking the note E, a lower auxiliary or lower neighbor tone back to the E again. That's the first musical idea in the vocal line. So what happens next? Well, we take the same rhythm and we do that with it. So same rhythm, the note pattern has slightly changed. C sharp is a harmony note, a chord tone. There's a passing note or a passing tone going back to the harmony again. So couldn't be more straightforward. And then he comes back the other way. So we've gone up and now we've come down. And then you notice that this rhythm is reused again. So we've got onto a long note. And this is another clever touch how he actually uses these long notes alongside these little short rhythmic fragments to allow the line to expand. And then after this long note here, well, we're back again, aren't we, to this little short motivic figure again. And then again. And now we have another long note that's pushing the phrase forwards, assisted by the piano accompaniment. And then the figure gets used again. So he's really kind of using this thing of these two semiquavers and quaver, the two sixteenth notes and the eighth note, uh, to kind of spin the line out of a very short idea that's usually a three note idea. Okay, well that takes us up to the long note there in the fourth bar and just into the next use of three notes that follow. Well then of course he slightly changes tack on the rhythm. So we have this dotted thing, dotted rhythm repeated and notice melodically it's very straightforward. It's all around G sharp. What are we doing? We're on G sharp. We go down one, we come back to G sharp. We go up one, 
the comeback to G-sharp. There's nothing complicated about that. And then manages to propel us forwards through greater use of the semiquavers or 16th notes to go to the highest point of the line. So do you see how this all becomes climactic? And there's a kind of rhythmic drive forwards by those faster notes there. Uh, to come to the peak of the phrase, again using that dotted rhythm that we've seen using there. And then there's a rhythmic augmentation. So we've got this rhythm, but notice that the note values are doubled to bring us towards the end of the phrase. And then we're just slowing down into a cadence in C sharp minor with a long note to finish. So you see how much of this is kind of the internal organization of the melody is kind of organized through the rhythm, isn't it? This rhythmic motif. But there's also a real sense of what we're doing melodically by often doing something very simple around one note, using the note below and the note above, and how sometimes we've got a bit of symmetry, a rising figure followed by a falling figure, followed by a rising figure, followed by a falling figure. You see how this is going, rising, falling, there's all that going on. And then just at the moment of climax, we have this rhythmic and melodic propulsion upwards to the top of the phrase, just to make sure that that feels like the peak of things. Okay, now, how is all this supported by the piano accompaniment? Well, at one level, there's a very simple idea going on, isn't there? This kind of constant chug, chug, chug of these quavers or eighth notes in the right hand of the piano part that just helps keep everything moving forwards. If there were sustained chords, it wouldn't work nearly as well. feel a bit kind of lifeless, wouldn't it? So listen to the impact of those repeated chords. It's a very simple idea, isn't it? But see, it have an immense impact, even though in performance, it's one of the more discrete things that might be going on. But without the repetition of those chords, the whole thing feels a bit limp, doesn't it? And then underneath all of that, well, what's the left hand of the piano doing? It's providing a bass line. Well, that's kind of what left hands often do. But there's also this wonderful melodic sense. Just have a look at what the left hand's doing. Starts on the tonic of C sharp, and it just works its way down a scale. You see how we're just going down this scale all the time, but very discreetly, and then a chromatic touch onto the dominant, and then down to the, to the tonic of F sharp, and then how it kind of moves on in octaves, it just reinforces the bass line. And I'd say that certainly from here, the bass line becomes more of a typical bass line. You know, we're kind of going down, you can feel the root movements of all these chords. Then one in second inversion, five, one. Whereas at the beginning, the left hand is also having a kind of melodic purpose, even though it's just going down the scale. So you can hear how it sort of interacts with the vocal line. And so on. It's hardly counterpoint, is it? But there is something a little bit contrapuntal about that. And besides being a bass line, the left hand has got something in terms of secondary melodic importance to offer the piece. And then, of course, it's how those things are combined. This melodic thing in the voice with its motivic design, this rather longer sustained secondary melodic idea in the left hand of the piano, and then this constant chug, chug, chug of the rhythm of the right hand as those chords are repeated. 
So it's very clever how all those things combine. And of course, then uh, the other magic ingredient is what's happening with the harmony. So if we go back to the beginning, we're in the key of C sharp minor. So a tonic chord of C sharp minor to begin. That seems perfectly reasonable. But then this is a gorgeous moment, isn't it? You hear that B in the bass. So we've got a C sharp minor with a seventh, haven't we? That B is the tonic seventh. So just starting on an ordinary C sharp minor chord, then adding the seventh, and then the bass moves down to A. And while we've still got the same triad going in the right hand, what was a C sharp minor triad that becomes a seventh is now an A major triad, A major chord, because it's an A major seventh. And then we move, so the right hand chord moves, and then you get to the end of this 2-2 two, two bar. I mean, that's interesting in itself, actually, just having a 2-2 two, two bar there randomly in the middle of the 4-4. Four, four. Um, but here we've got this 5-7 last inversion in the key of E. So, you know, are we modulating to E major? Well, we're not really, but it's a lovely close effect that you have with these sevens. You know, that's a very kind of close um, intensity, isn't it? And another seventh there, oh, absolutely gorgeous, isn't it? And that G sharp is screaming to resolve, which it does, of course, when we get there. And then you've got another seventh, a G sharp minor seventh. And then this is another extension of a chord. Now, this is interesting because it's really a C sharp minor nine that resolves. And then we've got at the end of this line, an F sharp minor seven. So you see how many sevenths and occasional ninths there are, making the harmony so rich. And then there's a kind of simplicity as we arrive in bar four, because that's just a C sharp minor chord, the tonic chord in first inversion. And that's coming just at the moment where the melodic line settles on that long note. And then we have another bit of dissonance. Can you hear what's happening there? That C sharp is going to resolve. So it's a seven, six. The C sharp's prepared here, it's sounded there, and it's resolved there. So there's a suspension in that. But as it resolves, you notice that chromatic note happening in the bass there. So what have we got going on here? We've got this chord. So we've got a French six going on. And then that French six doesn't kind of really go where you think it's gonna go because often a, a, an old bender six chord will be a predominant chord. Well, then we get this chord and you think, well, what's that about? Well, actually the French six is a predominant, but we've got a suspension going because it's prepared in the top of the right hand, sounded there, resolved here. So you see how that suspension is going above the bass. It's a four, three, so you get the French six. And then that resolves onto the E sharp, isn't it? Absolutely gorgeous. And then this is a dominant seventh in the key of F sharp. Okay, F sharp major, F sharp minor, who knows? Well, we go to F sharp minor, but he's also got a seventh there with that E natural. That's absolutely wonderful. And you notice what this results in is this chromatic movement. You know, F sharp, E sharp, E natural, D sharp, following on from the bass chromatic movement. D sharp, D natural, C sharp, F sharp, E sharp, E natural, D sharp. So this chromaticism adds to the intensity of the movement, doesn't it? Isn't that wonderful stuff? Sorry. So you see how that actually works, or would have worked if I played it right, but there you go. Um, and then we end up on the tonic chord of C sharp minor there, 
And so you think, oh, how's he going to get to his cadence from here, that C sharp minor? Well, he has an, another little suspension in the middle. This E, D, so that's interesting. Seven, six suspension. But why have we got a D major chord tucked in there? That is a Neapolitan chord in C sharp minor. A major chord on flat two, normally in first inversion. So C sharp minor, second degree is D sharp, lower it to D natural, give us a major chord, D F sharp A, put it in first inversion. There's your Neapolitan. And it's preparing us either for a dominant or for the tonic chord in second inversion, followed by the dominant. That's what happens. You get Neapolitan, tonic chord, second inversion. And then we've got the dominant seventh in C sharp minor. And then everything absolutely settles. When we come to this cadence in bar seven, we just feel as if everything is right with the world. We've had all this intensity and then he just relaxes everything into that cadence before we then get into this poco più animato, which is another fantastic, joyous corner. Well, again, there's plenty more we can say about that by going on for the rest of the piece, really. But I'm hoping that's at least just given you a flavour of what Rachmaninoff is doing in the first seven bars of vocalese. And we've thought about it in terms of melodic design, in terms of what he's doing with the rhythm, how that becomes motivic, what's happening in the harmony, the fantastic use of those extended chords and rather clever touches in the harmony and the, the chromaticism and so on, what's happening in relation to hints of keys other than the tonic key. We've talked about the texture, how each line has a part to play, the vocal line obviously with the principal melody, the right hand of the piano kind of gluing everything together with this continuous quaver eighth note thing. The left hand of the piano with a kind of secondary melodic idea with these long sustained notes kind of contrasting with a quicker moving line at the top. Um, so many things to take in and fascinating because we often associate the use of these kind of short musical motifs with baroque music. But here is Rachmaninoff uh, at the beginning of the 20th century writing something that's intensely kind of post-romantic and he's using this kind of baroque motivic device as one of the elements. Of course it's how that element combines with the other elements that let us into why Rachmaninoff doesn't sound at all baroque. Um, and we just begin to engage with some of the hallmarks of the Rachmaninoff style. Fantastic piece of music, fabulous composer. So do get to grips with vocalese and get to know even more Rachmaninoff. Well, if you've enjoyed this video, you might like to go to our website, www.mmcourses.co.uk. And while you're on the homepage, click on Maestros and you'll discover there are three levels of Maestros uh, which may appeal to you. Um, the first level uh, comes with exciting things like emojis and other little perks and it's really a support level. It's uh, your way of saying thank you to us and really more importantly supporting the work that we do. As you can imagine putting this immense amount of content we've got on YouTube and the regular production of all this material material <clears throat> is a huge investment of time and energy and finance and so it's just a way of, of expressing appreciation and helping us to continue with that work if you value it. If you want to go a bit further and bear in mind this is nothing to do with ability uh, lots of people worry that they might not be good enough. We've purposely organised this so you can be a beginner or you can be someone who's been studying music for years, doesn't matter. Um, if you want to move on to level two, then you have additional perks, including uh, access to a monthly live stream where we meet for an hour every month. And if you can't attend live, you can watch it recorded at any time to suit you. But if you can attend live, that's great because there's a live chat running, which you can contribute to if you want to. You can ask questions, pass comments, 
whatever you want to do there. It's a very friendly group as well. Uh, so that, that's lovely to make some new friends from around the world. And it enables me to do things like we've just done in this video, but to go further for a longer period, to go deeper. And also I try to be responsive to what members want. So when members make requests for topics, we try to include those in the program so we can make it very specific to things you want to know about. If you want to go a step further, well, then there's level three. Uh, so obviously you have all the perks of level one and level two, but at level three, there's an additional live stream every month uh, to which you can uh, submit your own compositions, arrangements, harmony exercises, recordings of your own performances, whatever you want to receive evaluative feedback on. So I'll give you one-to-one -one feedback on whatever it is you want to hand in. And again, the live chat runs so people can ask questions and we can all reflect together on those submissions and we can all learn so much from each other by getting feedback on our own work, but also seeing what other people are up to. And it makes it far less of a lonely journey. Many people have told me over the years, Music can be a lonely trail. I'm just sitting on my own, practicing, composing, doing whatever I'm doing. I don't really know what other people are up to. Well, this is a great opportunity of connecting with other people and sharing in the journey. Um, so if any of that's any of use to you, well, there's Maestro's. Back on the homepage, you can also click on Courses and that will take you to our extensive range of courses. Uh, unlike the YouTube things, which are all kind of one-offs, uh, in the course material, we're providing A to Z training in musical theory, oral training, oral dictation, analysis, orchestration, all sorts of topics there. So that might be something that's more focused and more directed that uh, might be of great value to you. Anyway, have a look at www.mmcourses.co.uk to find out more about those things and much more.